On this edition of Native Report, we attend a multimedia exhibit by artist Jonathan Thunder and experience his paintings that combine social commentary and surrealism. We meet David Manuel from the Red Lake Nation and learn about beekeeping along with other sustainable food initiatives. And we visit the Shakopee Metawakanton Sioux community and learn what can be done to improve access to healthy, affordable foods. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Metawakanton Sioux community the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Welcome to Native Report. I'm Rita Aspinwall. And I'm Ernie Stevens. The images that Jonathan Thunder creates are dreamscape representations of the world he sees and experiences around him. They are a blend of social commentary, pop culture, and surrealism that bring traditional cultural motifs into the present. Join us now as we attend his exhibition. It is hours before the Edge Center for the Arts opens its doors to the public for Jonathan Thunder's solo exhibition, and he is making some final adjustments to an installation piece for the show. It's my drawing table, a bunch of ink drawings that climb up the wall. Uh, I have a, a friend that's an installation artist, and I wasn't exactly sure if, it's a big space, I wasn't exactly sure if I had enough paintings for it, and it turned out that I did but uh, he suggested that I do an installation piece. The title of this show is uh, The Politics of Dreams Defying Dilettantism, which for me is, um, I think a general definition of the word dilettantism is uh, somebody who's a dabbler. And for me, I've taken my dreams and my artwork to a level where I'm, I wouldn't consider myself dabbling in it. I'm, I'm pretty much, fully immersed in the process of trying to put that on canvas and present it at my shows. I've said that it, my paintings and my work come from the same place that dreams come from. And this year I've done a lot of focusing on uh, that concept, you know, like working from intuition, working from dreams. Many of the canvases are large, the colors bold and striking, and the subject matter may be open to interpretation by the viewer. Other paintings do have deliberate meanings conveyed by Jonathan. That diptych is called The Most Dangerous Game, and it's about the game of love. And uh, in the painting you see the, ma uh, the man and woman have a skull head signifying uh, mortality, and the woman holds a pistol, and the man holds a flower kind of signifying some of the... Um, different pieces that you might find in relationships that become unhealthy. When I painted that piece, I was in a place where I was realizing the importance of love being based on respect, like a mutual respect. And I had seen a lot of things in my life where it can turn into domestic violence or you know, head games and things like that. That painting is called The Hand of God. And I painted it 10 years ago and uh, it's these two animals are looking at this human hand that is not rooted in the ground, but has suction cups sucking the blood out of the ground. But uh, with everything that's happening nowadays uh, surrounding the whole Standing Rock situation, I figured it was relevant to pull it out of, out of hiding and uh, present it. Basically the concept is uh, working with earth as opposed to sucking the earth dry. I think I was struck by I feel like Jonathan, in a lot of ways, is a study in contradiction. I think you've got these really, really intense paintings. Some of them are dark, some of them are so funny. you got his two little kittens at the studio that he's playing with them, and there's such a gentleness about him, too, that I think I was just struck by how authentic he is. I think it's so different from anything that I've seen up here. Um, 
so colorful, so bold. He's just extremely original. I felt like this was the kind of show that I would want to go see at the gallery as a member of the community. Earlier that day, Jonathan was a special guest at the Big Fork School where he worked with the 7th and 8th graders on a video shown as part of the exhibit. The gallery draws from the greater northern Itasca County area. Does anyone else smell burnt hair? We were pleased after visiting Jonathan's studio this summer, my co-director, Yasmin Scrivener and I, um, and, and that's when we booked him to do the work with the students. He showed us a few of his pieces, and at the Edge Center, we try to incorporate an educational piece as often as we can for the Big Fork students. And he had done some remarkable work with students, and he was very willing, in fact, to work with our students. It's been a very special day here. We made a short film that was kind of a, I guess what, uh, you could call it in, improv, and we just, we winged it. It ended up being kind of like Star Wars, meets pizza, meets mutants, meets uh, James Bond, uh, meets um, lasers, you know, and it was, it was basically, I wanted to come in and build, build something with the kids that they wanted, they, they would find entertaining. As a native artist, I get pushed into this uh, small block where I'm expected to create certain images and have a certain, um, I guess, uh, stay inside of a certain range of um, what audience I can appeal to. And I think that sometimes we forget about where art has been, you know, and some of the early artists, some of the early painters really pushed the boundaries. The large canvases are, for me, it kind of pays homage to the, uh, the heritage of painting, the roots of painting. <clears throat> when I was studying painting, I noticed that a lot of the old school, like old masters painted on large canvases. Colors in my paintings, I would say, are uh, something that's always appealed to me. I trained in the Southwest, where I studied painting at the Institute of American Indian Arts, and during that time, I was uh, surrounded by a lot of vibrant colors, and I've been told that uh, uh, that's kind of signature, like people can recognize one of my paintings. I wouldn't think that I'm afraid of the concept of fame. Um, I think with Facebook and things of the like, we're all kind of, you know, like famous if you really look at it. And for me, uh, my profession is to just do artwork. Diabetic neuropathy is painful and is the most chronic complication of diabetes, happening when high blood sugars damage nerves over time. The most common form of diabetic neuropathy is in the feet and legs. We call this peripheral neuropathy. Often it seems to get worse at night. The symptoms include burning pain or numbness, or a reduced ability to feel pain or changes in temperature. Some people get muscle weakness that can affect your balance or coordination. Diabetic neuropathy can contribute to ulcers, infections, and deformities. The autonomic nervous system takes care of things that normally operate automatically, controlling your heart, stomach, lungs, intestines, bladder, eyes, and sex organs. Diabetes and high blood sugars can affect any of these, leading to urinary tract infections, incontinence, constipation, or uncontrolled diarrhea, difficulty swallowing, as well as an increase or decrease in sweating. Autonomic neuropathy can affect the ability to adjust blood pressure and heart rate that can lead to lightheadedness and standing and can contribute to falls. Vaginal dryness and erectile dysfunction are things no one wants to talk about, but both can be caused by uncontrolled blood sugars. Another type of diabetic neuropathy is radiculoplexus neuropathy, affecting the nerves in the legs, thighs, buttocks, or hips. Symptoms usually happen on one side of the body, and most people improve at least partially over time. The symptoms can include sudden sharp pain in the hip and thigh or buttock, and some people can get weakening of the thigh muscles, making it difficult to rise from a sitting position. Another type of diabetic neuropathy is called mononeuropathy and involves damage to a specific nerve in the face, torso, or leg. It tends to come on suddenly and usually happens in older adults. It usually doesn't cause any long-term problems, but it can be scary while it's happening. 
The signs and symptoms depend on which nerve is involved and can include difficulty focusing your eyes, aching behind one eye, difficulty focusing or double vision, Bell's palsy or paralysis on one side of your face, pain in your shin or foot, pain in your lower back or pelvis, pain in the front of your thigh, and pain in your chest or abdomen. Often this can be hard to figure out and bad things have to be checked for and ruled out first. The nerve fibers in our bodies are small and delicate and high blood sugars damage them over time. Smoking and alcohol abuse can damage nerves and blood vessels and need to be avoided to prevent worsening diabetic neuropathy. Charcot joint usually happens in the foot and is joint deterioration caused by nerve damage. This is a bad complication that can happen to people with poorly controlled diabetes. Diabetic neuropathy can cause a loss of sensation that contributes to this and keeping blood sugars controlled can prevent this from happening. Diabetes affects all parts and all systems of the body. The reason your healthcare provider is concerned about high blood sugars is to prevent problems that can be difficult to treat once they progress. Having diabetes is a drag and a burden, but it can be controlled with education, medicine, and lifestyle changes. Taking care of your diabetes is worth the effort. You have people who care about you and depend on you. Remember to call an elder. They've been waiting for your call. I'm Dr. Arnie Vineo, and this is Health Matters. Depending upon the season, David Manuel of the Red Lake Nation can be found either in the woods, on the lake, in his garden, or tending to his honeybees. David also works for the Red Lake Local Food Initiative that promotes healthy lifestyles that can be achieved through the traditional foods of the Ojibwe Nation. It is a cool summer day, and activity around Dave and Laura Manuel's beehive is slow. Their decision to try their hands at beekeeping is because they both like the idea of making their own food. I got interested in, in uh, beekeeping uh, by attending a, a bee workshop held in Bemidji uh, about three, four years ago. There was a workshop and uh, my wife and I attended and we just got the bee bug. I just like the idea of it, um, having also been uh, doing a lot of reading about uh, colony collapse disorder and how uh, our uh, pollinators were being threatened. I just thought I could uh, do something, do something positive about beekeeping and, and keeping be, uh, honeybees going. Uh, even though we have our own indigenous bees here, you know, in our nation. But I just like the idea of, of, of making honey. We enjoy doing it. There are a few beekeepers in and around the Red Lake region, so this has been a learning experience for the couple. What I've learned is it's really tough uh, in this northern climate to winter bees. In fact, I only know of one person that successfully wintered bees, and he lives in Nashwalk. Um, in fact, our bees died last year, and we did try to winter them, but they didn't survive. And I think about my bees in one hive. I know they start out in the thousands, but they can, I think they go up to 20-some thousand at the height of their uh, activity in, in foraging for pollen and nectar. It's a little cold today. Um, it was raining earlier, so their activity has died down to where they're probably, uh, most of them are in the hive. They're really quiet right now. Here we have four segments of hive. The two smaller upper ones are called supers. That's, that's beekeeper lingo for where, uh, as, as the season goes on, here down here, the queen is mating and, and, uh, and creating new bees all the time. Um, bees actually only have a lifespan of maybe two months, three months, and, they, and, and then they die, they're worker bees. Inside the hives, the hive boxes, we have frames. And inside the frames, hold on, we have where the bees are, are doing their thing. But you'll see on the top of the frame, 
where they are uh, capping off honey. So this hive here is in pretty good shape. David hasn't mowed his lawn since he's been beekeeping, but only so he can provide a source of food for his colonies. Beekeeping is one way the Manuels keep past traditions alive in the present. They also make maple syrup, harvest wild rice, go berry picking, and hunt. I find myself drawn to these, these uh, activities that uh, find me outside, you know, in the sun or in the rain uh, or in the snow. And I just find myself happy doing those kinds of things. I think we as uh, Indian people need to reconnect with, uh, with how our ancestors got by day to day, year to year. And they did it without going to the grocery store. They did it on their own. They, they had their gardens and they went out and they foraged and hunted and gathered. And that's the reason we're here today. You know, a uh, hundred years ago, we didn't have to think about these things. You know, uh, everything was organic. It's just very satisfying to know that, you know, our time, our effort, our love has, has brought us this joy and, and uh, it tastes and great. Yeah, and it's healthy. You know, the, the, the benefits of, of uh, eating honey are, you know, just, just astronomical. They're, they're full of anti, uh, I don't even know how to say that word. They're, they're full of uh, good stuff that, that, that helps your body, helps your immune, immune system be stronger. The fact of the matter is, is that Laura and I, we can't make enough either honey or maple sugar to satisfy the demand amongst their own people. And that's why I'm always encouraging people to make that time for themselves, to go do it themselves. It's, if I can do it, anyone can. At the end of the day or at the end of the season, you're, you're gonna be very happy and you're gonna ask yourself, just like I did, why didn't I do this before? I have written an article saying that it was, it's a miracle that we are here, that we are here at all, because we survived the Revolutionary War where many of our men were killed. Uh, the women also fought in the Revolutionary War. And after the war, uh, quickly on the heels of the war came the Indian Removal Act and uh, President Jackson was bound that all the tribes east of the Mississippi were going west and we were one of them. And we arrived here where there was plenty of food uh, sufficient for the people, but they had no, they had no uh, shelters. There were no shelters here when they arrived. And uh, they couldn't plant their gardens for their beans and squash and corn um, when they arrived the first year. So history, all of that detail of daily living for our ancestors is, is really, um, really exciting. It's more exciting than anything you can get on TV as far as I'm concerned. Extreme poverty and the loss of traditional foods have caused many Native Americans to suffer from poor or inadequate diets. This has led to increased obesity, diabetes, and other profound health problems. Seeds of Native Health is a multifaceted national campaign supported by the Shakopee, Midewakanton and Sioux community that seeks to improve Native American nutrition. The inaugural conference of Native Nutrition brought together tribal officials, researchers, practitioners, and others to discuss the current state of indigenous and academic scientific knowledge about Native nutrition and food science. September 26th and 27th, we had the first National Native American Nutritional Conference. And this conference, 
the overarching goal was to bridge this long-standing gap between indigenous knowledge and wisdom around food, you know, our traditional foods and our food ways, bridge that gap um, that exists between that and academic research and academic knowledge. I knew that this would be a good conference. I felt that there was interest. You know, we've have felt this momentum building around food and nutrition for our people. But I was blown away by the response. We had 450 registrants. We had a waiting list. We had registrants from 32 different states, from about 40 to 50 different tribes. We had international speakers, and it was amazing. We had breakout sessions where we talked about social determinants for nutritional health. We talked about health education programs, and we talked about improving the nutrition, the nutrition of Native communities. The Shakopee Mdewakanton Sioux Community and the University of Minnesota's Healthy Foods, Healthy Lives Institute hosted this milestone event that is a project of Seeds of Native Health. I served as secretary treasurer for the Shakopee Mdewakanton, and it was during that administration where we um, developed the idea um, and started implementing Seeds of Native Health. So what we did is we made a two-year commitment, $5 million, to address the nutritional and health crisis among Natives. And we did this by engaging two re-granters. So we gave them a portion of the money to re-grant to Native programs. So we work with two amazing Native nonprofits, First Nations Development Institute and the Nota Begay the Third Foundation. Over the past two years, they have made 51 grants, totaling $2.5 million. And we also wanted to pay atten some attention to helping others gain a better understanding of this nutritional crisis. You can look at just about any health, social, economic indicator and see that Natives are disproportionately affected. We know that about 81% of Native people are overweight or obese. We know that they are much more likely to develop type 2 diabetes than the general population. Um, other uh, health indicators that are related to nutrition are also disproportionately affected in things like cardiovascular disease, um, inflammatory diseases, and so on. If these health disparities continue as they are unchecked, our youth, Native youth right now, will be the first generation not to outlive their parents. Lori is committed to the cause of improving the nutritional health across Indian Country. On her home reservation, she was instrumental in establishing Wazupi, their community garden. It has grown from an acre and a half to, I believe, almost 18 acres now of produce production. We have um, a large orchard that's organically tended to. Uh, we have chickens. We uh, have apiaries, apiaries, many apiaries. I can't even tell you how many, probably millions of bees that we have. And we collect honey, harvest the honey. Uh, we have a sugar bush. Um, we have two angora goats. So all of that um, is to give our community members the opportunity to be engaged in, in good food, in healthy food. And, and hopefully have a, a healthy life. Because of the inaugural conference's success and high attendance, planning is underway for the second annual conference on Native American nutrition. One way that we're going to know um, how effective uh, our dollars are being used or what kind of impact that we're able to have in Native communities is that um, there's accountability for, for the grantees. And this is one of the reasons why I was so happy that we engaged First Nations 
and Notre Dame the Third Foundation because they have the experience and the capacity not only to work with their grantees and provide technical assistance, but also to do some evaluation. We will have another conference, and I'm hopeful then that we are going to hear stories about what has happened over the last year and what kind of progress have people made. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors in Indian Country. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. We'll see you next time on Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and is an ICWA social worker with Fond du Lac Social Services. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and is a film and television producer. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. <laughs>